December, 1920, when the German Communist Party became the Nazi Party, until January of 1933, when the Nazis seized power in Germany, the KKK, the German Communist Party, was far and away the largest and most important non-Russian Communist Party in the world. It was, if you please, the pride of the common term. It was the one party in an advanced industrial society which seemed to have even the slightest chance of making that kind of anti-capitalist revolution, which Lenin and the Bolsheviks had always said would really carry the day in Europe. And consequently, that German party was something that the common term talked about and wrote about incessantly. Now listen to this quotation from the Executive Committee of the Communist International, coming from November of 1930. Of the foremost place among the common term sections in capitalist countries has been and is taken by the German Communist Party. It is one of the best organized communist parties, the largest one numerically, with deep roots in the working class, and the leader of the broad masses. Now, when that was written in November of 1930, the German Communist Party was already a party of 124,000 members, but which in the elections of that year had already around four and a half million votes. And that strength of the German Communist Party would grow incessantly until that moment that the Nazi took power. So that if you go to the end of the year 1932, you are dealing with a party of 200,000 members, and which in the last elections of 1932, corralled 6 million votes. And if you combine those 6 million votes with the millions that the SPD got in those last elections, that the two working class parties did outscore by a million and a half votes the total of the National Socialist Party of a long and yet, in January of 1933, the Nazis seized power. And within two months, by March of 1933, they had dissolved the German Communist Party almost without any resistance at that late date. And then they proceeded not only to expropriate the locale, but to expropriate all of the property of the German Communist Party, uh, to expel its hundred deputies of the Reichstag from that parliamentary body, and finally, of course, to begin that horrendous drama of communist militants, to put them in prison, to torture them, to send them to their death in concentration camps. And it followed like that for the Social Democrats shortly after that. A catastrophe, you see. A catastrophe which was the greatest catastrophe in the entire 25-year history of the common term. That within the blink of an eye, as it were, that most important communist party outside of Russia disappeared from political life. And the consequences, if you can begin to stretch your imagination, are unmeasurable. Without a communist movement in Germany, who, after all, could prevent the elaboration of Nazi institutions in Germany? Who could prevent the expansion of that German imperialism over the populations of Europe, subjecting those populations to a new reign of barbarism? But think of it more than that. Without a big German Communist Party in the 1930s, what chance was there possibly for converting that world economic crisis into a socialist revolution in Europe? There wasn't any. And how to explain that catastrophe? And it is Trotsky who writes a very brilliant article a month and a half after the German Communist Party has been dissolved. And it is an article called The Tragedy of the German Proletariat. And Trotsky goes right to the jugular, and he says that the root cause of this tragedy is that the German Communist Party became a satellite of Moscow, a satellite of the Communist International as run by Stalin. But that it did the will and the service of that common turn from Moscow. That it followed the line faithfully and without deviation under Stalin, uh, because all of its leaders were of the satraps of Stalin. And consequently, at those crucial moments, the line was a terrific blunder. 
It was the kind of blunder that led to that tragedy that in the late 1920s and early 30s, when the fascist menace was very real, what was required was some kind of an anti-fascist resistance front. What was required was that the communists make their alliance with the social democrats and to make a kind of wall beyond which the Nazis couldn't pass. But it was precisely the time when the common turn was preaching the line of social fascism, that social democrats were really social fascists. And in fact, they were worse than fascists because they had a greater opportunity to be fought and to be befuddle the working classes. And when finally the communists did make their efforts in 1932 to come to some kind of common front with the socialists against fascism, it was too late. And consequently, the socialists didn't believe them, and the authors were not taken very seriously. And yet, if we say that Trotsky goes to the jugular, and that in the large, he is quite a main point, then we also must say that there is something simplistic about that answer also. That after all, there is an implication that the evil of the common term, its domination over its national sections, really began in the Stalinist period, and that somehow the earlier period is exonerated. And yet it is literally true that in that era when Lenin and Trotsky and Zinoviev were the key figures in the Communist International, that the way in which the German Communist Party made its strategy and made its mind was also upon the advice and the orders of Moscow, and that those common turn agents after all who were in Germany were constantly the funnel between Moscow and what the German Party was supposed to do. Granted that there are vast differences, we know perfectly well, and we have plenty of evidence for this, that in the Stalin period, the common turn had scant interest in world revolution or in helping revolutions in any of its member countries, that it was much more concerned with the well-being, with the strength, with the force of the Soviet Union as a national state, that it was reflecting, after all, that strategy of socialism in one country, whereas in the earlier period, the Lenin period, there was a very profound interest in world revolution, in fact, so many hopes had been pinned upon that. In the second place, it is literally true that the early common turn looked upon Germany as really the center of that revolution, the place in which you had to make your greatest contribution in order to help it. It was the revolution that fueled the optimism and the hopes of those early Bolshevik leaders. It is true, finally, that much of the advice that the German communists got from Lenin or from Radek, who knew Germany better than any of the others in the Bolshevik schema, that some of that advice was very sound, very sober, and at times very brilliant. But that doesn't gainsay the point that I am making, that we cannot assume, as Trotsky seems to imply, that the entire relationship between center and base, between summit and national section, changed under Stalin, that the pattern was there before, and that in reality, much of the advice that the common turn agents were to give in Germany in very crucial years, years between 1920 and 23, when you needed a very critical and careful understanding of the conditions in Germany in order to turn an objective situation into a revolutionary crisis, in that period, much of the advice and the diktat of the common turn agents was sectarian and very schematic, and the root of terrific blunders, like the blunder in March of 1921, when the common turn said you must have an offensive, when there was no potentiality for it, and the blunder of the summer of 1923, when there was a revolutionary situation, and the common turn was taking a cautious position and was in a line of retreat. And consequently, there is something in that Trotsky analysis that really founders upon two very important problems. One is the problem of why the common turn made the mistakes that it made in the early 1920s, and the other is a fascinating problem that we must elaborate somewhat because it bolts so very large. And that is the problem of the contradiction 
uh, between Soviet state interests and the interest of the world revolution, which is not a contradiction that is born simply under stop, but that actually roots back into the earliest development of the Soviet state, that you already have that kind of concern for national well-being that begins to transcend the concern for the member states of the communist international, that the common turn at very crucial moments really does sell out its member sections for the sake of Soviet well-being. And that already surfaces, you see, in 1921. It surfaces at that time that the Soviet Union moves into its strategy of net or the new economic policy. That period when there will be both internal relaxation and external re-establishment of ties with the capitalist world. That Russia has come to a point where she needs breathing space. And consequently, the new economic policy, as we'll see, means relaxation of the pressure upon the peasants inside Russia, but it also means relaxation of international tensions, uh, to try to establish relations with the capitalist world, and consequently to enable Russia uh, to break out of her isolation. And does that create ambiguities in the relationship between the Comintern and Communist parties? Of course it does. It surfaces very clearly for the first time in the relationship between the Soviet Union and the Turkey of Kemal Ataturk or Mustafa Kemal. Because you see, this is a Turkey which Russia wants to have very friendly relations with. A Turkey that controls the straits. A Turkey that claims to be anti-imperialist. And then of course it comes into complete conflict with the interests of Turkish communism, which begins to get its roots. You see, this Mustafa Kemal is like the antecedent of all of those reforming, progressive military gods. The antecedent of Nasser, of the antecedent of Boumediene, of those military gods in Peru now, of the ones, after all, who are nationalists, who are really embarrassed and ashamed of the degradation of their country, and who think in terms of nationalist revolutions that are basically bourgeois. Uh, this was a Kemal Ataturk or a Mustafa Kemal, who was a commander in Anatolia in 1919 and couldn't stand what was happening to Turkey, how it was being pieced up after its defeat, how everybody was gnawing at the prey of Turkey, and consequently began a nationalist movement. <laughs> began a nationalist movement which spread from Anatolia all over what was left of Turkey and finally managed to establish its nationalist government by September of 1920. And you see him to the left in general, somebody who is willing to confront uh, the old kind of religious framework of the society, who's willing to order that women take their veils off, who's willing to build schools for Turkish school children, who's willing to tackle the problem of industrialization and even to get back the natural resources of Turkey which are so uh, grabbed up by the Western imperialists. All of that puts Mustafa Kemal into uh, the progressive camp. But he is a bourgeois, he is anti-communist, and consequently once he establishes his position, he begins to crush the Turkish communist movement. And now that Turkish communist movement really had some roots in 1920. And those groups were threefold. A part of those Turkish prisoners of war in Russia, like that great Turkish socialist Sufi, uh, who was in Russia during the war and organized so many of his fellow prisoners into communists, into revolutionaries, and by the summer of 1920 had sent about 8,000 of them back in order to do work as communist organizers. Sufi himself uh, going back in November of 1920. A second source, the so-called German Turks, those who were exiled or living in Germany during the period of the German-Turkish alliance, and who came under the influence of Spartacism, and they went back to Turkey and centered largely in Ankara, and there established clandestinely of the first Turkish communist
1920, in June of 1920, uh, but then you get an indigenous route. Uh, you get in the Anatolian villages, uh, peasants who are really so benighted, uh, so oppressed, that they begin to get the word about Soviets. And you can imagine that in 1920, that these Turkish peasants out in these villages, uh, calling themselves the Green Army, are beginning to organize Soviets. They rightly know what these local councils are about, but they know that somehow it is liberating. And they also are for the national liberation of their country. And they begin to fight at the side of Mustafa Kemal. But at the point that Mustafa Kemal doesn't need the Russians, that he has established his position, then it is to destroy the Turkish communist movement. And consequently, he orders the destruction of its top leadership on the 28th of January of 1921. Sufi and 17 other communist leaders are drowned in the sea, uh, which is a traditional Turkish way of eliminating the political opposition. And consequently, uh, the Turkish communist movement uh, decapitated. But for the Russians, that's January of 1921. The 16th of March of that same year, they signed their friendship treaty uh, with the Turkish government of Mustafa Kemal. Uh, because it is important to them for their national interests uh, to have an anti-imperialist state on their frontier, an anti-imperialist state in charge of the Straits. But you see, if it is that way with Turkey, what is it with Germany? Uh, because certainly the Russians will walk when they come to the idea that the world revolution isn't tomorrow morning. Uh, they will want some kind of friendly relations uh, with that Weimar Republic. And consequently, it will create a tremendous ambiguities uh, for the KKD, uh, for the German Communist Party. And the reasons for an alliance are perfectly clear. Uh, for the Russians, after all, uh, the main enemy in Europe are the Western imperialists, are the ones who are creating uh, the intervention armies and really disrupting Russia. And Germany is likewise the victim of those same Entente powers, and consequently the potentiality of a real alliance between them is always there. Furthermore, Germany, an advanced industrial country uh, that has the technology, that has the goods, so that if there is no revolution, well, my God, or where are the Russians really even to begin uh, to get their equipment? But for the Germans, why an interest in Russia? And the interest is greatest, obviously, not with the Social Democrats, but with the ruling classes, with right-wing circles. <coughs> Oh yes, they hate Bolshevism, and they don't like Bolshevs in their midst. But something fascinates them about this Russia. All the wrong things. What fascinates them is that it's authoritarian, that there are no stripes there. That somehow in Russia, maybe they've got some answers. You find some very strange political thinking in Germany in the period of the early 1920s. There is General von Seck, for example, who really is a tremendously important a tremendously important military guy who becomes the commander-in-chief of the German military forces after the Kopf Putsch. And von Seck is a guy who was a little shot, who wanted revenge against the Entente, who felt that they had to undo of the work of that side. And so he looked over at Russia as the only really potential ally in undoing of the decision of that side. But more than that, for a military guy like von Set. The idea of Russia as a friend meant that you could develop military equipment that really was forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles. That the Germans weren't permitted uh, to fabricate all kinds of weaponry of war, but they could do it by helping the Russians in their war industry, and consequently by testing out all sorts of new weaponry, a very important calculation with the German military. Or you take an industrialist like Walter Lattenau, the head of the AEG of the German General Electric Trust. 
And this Gartenau looked upon Russia as a legitimate market for German goods, first of all, a place where German investment might find some kind of home. But then you see Rottenau also is a kind of a weird political thinker. And consequently, he is looking over at an authoritarian socialist system in Russia and finding some very good ideas. Maybe it's that sort of thing that Germany ought to have, except not destroy private property. Uh, but have, you see, uh, that good structure in which a certain kind of managerial class really does organize the productivity of the country. And finally, you have those strangest of all types, of the ones who think of the national revolution and who are very close uh, to those weirdos of the left called the national Bolsheviks, of people like Laufenberg and like Lundheim in Hamburg, of those who say uh, that really Germany per se, the whole country was a proletarian. Uh, the whole country, after all, had to launch a, what was called a folks free, a people's war, and consequently there would be an internal revolution at the same time as getting back uh, the national greatness of Germany. Uh, well, you see, uh, there were conservatives who were very close to that idea. Uh, the idea of a folks free really appealed to them, but not the idea of an interior your revolution, but yes, with the working classes having some kind of a very real place in a corporate society, all of that, all of that was a road to the Soviet Union. And the most active traveler on that road was Karl Rotte, and he is fantastic in love. He really is such a corrupt character in certain ways, and yet so absolutely brilliant, and so very incisive, and he certainly knew more about Germany than anybody in the Russian high command. And so he was arrested you know, in Germany in February of 1919, after the suppression of the January events. And so he goes to prison, and for six months it's very hard on him, uh, because he was put virtually in isolation. Then comes an order uh, from the high command itself, and that is that he should be put in a very favorable cell in the prison, uh, with free flow of visitors. And what had happened was that the German ruling circles were interested in talking to Rabe and finding out what they could about the possibilities of a real entente. And so he has a veritable political salon in this prison. And yet, for example, Colonel Max Bauer, who had been chief of intelligence for Lundborg, visiting him often and saying, yes, yes, Russia will be our ally when we undo the whole verdict of that side. But Rattenau is most interesting. And you see, Rattenau himself writes all this up in a memoir that he produces in 19. And the place in which he talks about his conversations with Rottenau are perfectly fantastic uh, because Rottenau is ranting on about the fact that the age of traditional capitalism is over. Yes, socialism is much the better word, uh, but he makes a distinction, says Rottenau, uh, between what he calls destructive socialism, the kind Marx had, and consequently what he called constructive socialism, uh, which doesn't touch property relationships. <laughs> Uh, that socialism is really a corporatism that he's thinking about, in which this managerial class is going to be able to animate uh, the economic system and to provide, assuredly, for places for everyone uh, within the social structure. He says a fascinating thing to Rob He says, you know, you people will make it out there. You don't have strikes, you have managerial costs, and so forth. But you will certainly make it, and in a few years, I will come to you as a technician because you will need my technical. Help. Uh, you will need the technical help of German industry. I will come to you with my technical help, and you've already been receiving me in silk and rose. Well, it's 40 years too soon. But it's about to say it's literally true of that there was that kind of intrigue, and Rodek himself carries back to Russia a kind of sobriety about the possibility of a German revolution, and that is going to play heavily. Uh, when he had come to Germany in December of 1918, he had been full of the enthusiasm uh, that the revolution was imminent there. But gradually he saw uh, that social democracy and trade unionism really had 
capture the minds of the German working classes, and that it would take a very long time before this German revolution. And so it was important for the Russians uh, to begin to make deals with the capitalist states. And consequently, he says uh, in the Central Committee in February of 1920, when he returns, uh, Germany and Russia need economic relations with one another because neither country can hope to get from the Entente alone what it needs, and because they can help one another uh, in many ways. You see what we are talking about? We are talking about a very long, very complex road to Rapallo. Uh, because it is at Rapallo in Italy on the 16th of April of 1922 that the Russians strike a treaty arrangement with the Germans. And consequently, that they begin to normalize uh, the relationships with the Weimar Republic. Now, on that road to Rapallo, uh, there are many landmarks, but just let me cite a few uh, because they help you to understand something about the problems then of German communism. Uh, one of the landmarks is quite obviously of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, because Versailles meant for the Germans terrible reparations. It meant that the possible reoccupation of Germany by the Ottoman powers, and consequently the imperative of having an ally. And Versailles meant something else. It meant that you couldn't produce weaponry on German soil, and the German military hell bent on producing military equipment and willing to do it inside Russia. And consequently, an arrangement is worked out. Uh, there is a Soviet emissary named Kopp, who is sent to Berlin in the summer of 1921, and he works out an arrangement whereby the German military and German industrialists will come to Russia and will refurbish their worn out arms factories so that Krupp will be responsible for shells and for guns, uh, so that Fold will be responsible for submarines, uh, so that Albatross Berka will be responsible for airplanes and so forth. The deal was initialed by Trotsky the next month. It didn't quite go through that way because the Russian factories were in such bad shape, but the point is that the Germans did produce and test a lot of military equipment in Russia in the period of the 1920s. And finally, the landmark of Genoa. Uh, because there was, you see, at Genoa, on the 10th of April of 1922, a conference in which Soviet delegates, for the first time, met the capitalist West in an international conference. And it was the conference to see whether the international capitalist world would accept the Soviet Union as some participating member of the world, and Genoa was a tremendous disappointment for the Bolsheviks. Uh, they had gone there with the idea uh, that they might get a glory recognition, uh, that they might get credits, uh, that they might get some sign that they were not a pariah country, and all they got were signs by the oil company representatives wanting concessions over their oil. And consequently, they left Genoa, thinking that the West wanted to turn them into a semi-colony, rushed off to Rapallo, and there at Rapallo, signed a treaty with the Germans. Now, that is important from the point of view of the perspectives of where the Soviet government goes. In other words, it will always go from Rapallo on in the direction of a balance of power. That will be a central principle of its diplomacy, that Russia must never permit a united front of all the capitalist powers against it, and that it must ally with one part of a divided capitalist world in order to protect itself. Now you see, every country defends itself, and every country, whether it's communist or not, defends its national interest. And the Chinese, who do many revolutionary things, certainly do that. And they do it at times in a detestable way from the point of view of the revolutionary interests of other countries. But at least, you see, the Chinese don't have a common term. And they don't have the capacity to dictate interior policy in various parties. And consequently, there is something different about this conflict of interest within a Soviet state that also is the dominant interest within the Communist International. And what it means for the KKK, 
what it means for uh, the German Communist Party is that it will constantly be programmed in a dialogue between the offensive and the retreat. Depending upon the way that the Soviet Union reads the world, if they read it in terms of the advantage of world revolution, then the German party will be put upon the offensive. If they read it in terms of the essentials of accommodation with the rest of the world, uh, then the party will be put upon the defensive. It's a kind of rhythm that is batted out or tapped out by the common term based upon the Soviet reading of the world and not based upon the interior condition inside it. And that party is really formed in 1920. Because it's in 1920, you see, that the German Communist Party goes from being a little sect or a small party that was decimated in January and February of 1919 into being a mass party. And the architect of that effort is Paul Lady. And it is Paul Lady who has a tactic which goes in two steps or two stages. The first stage is to eliminate the left-wing elements that in his judgment have created havoc within the, within the party. And consequently, he takes on that left wing in October of 1919 at the Second Communist Party Congress held in Heidelberg. Now the people who named it was attacking were the ones who we call gauchis or ultra-leftists who disbelieved in the use of parliament, who really condemned working inside trade unions, who said all of that was reformist power, who insisted on privileging spontaneity over any kind of organization, who had an ultimate faith in mass action on the street as over against any kind of leadership or any kind of party intervention. Now, to a certain degree, you cannot condemn those ultra-leftists when they reason the way Herman Hawker reasons. And I have read part of his answer to Lenin, that open letter to Lenin in reply to left-wing communism. But Herman was an extremely brilliant Dutch social theorist, really put his finger on what is the principle behind this ultra-leftism when he said, that the only way you break the old habits of people is not letting them go through those old habits. That you really have to have a tremendous kind of revolutionary commitment and say you will not compromise in any way, shape, or form. And so in that sense, Carter is saying that the common term really is uh, opportunist. As the Third International does not believe that the proletariat stands alone in West Europe, it neglects the intellectual development of the proletariat, which still lives deeply under the influence of bourgeois ideology, and chooses a tactic which allows slavery and subordination to the ideas of the bourgeoisie to continue. We, the left, choose, the, uh, choose our tactics above all with the aim of freeing the mind of the proletariat. That's the justification. And yet, Lady was quite right in practice, I think, in saying that there were always excesses built into that kind of a position and which went in the direction either of Putschism, in other words, of attempting some kind of great revolutionary stroke of the moment and consequently getting repression brought down on your heads and also cutting you off from the mass, or else the heresy of syndicalism. But that simply workers councils by themselves could do what ultimately a party has to do. And so maybe went all the way. And at that Congress of Heidelberg in 1919, he insisted upon his thesis of going to elections, of going into trade unions, and got the majority to vote for those theses, and consequently he left, which was a sizable faction in that small party, left, and consequently formed his own party, the German Communist Workers' Party, became, uh, became APD, but which became kind of a sectarian party uh, that ultimately dwindled away. The second step of Davies' tactic was to go to the mass. And to go to the mass was to fuse with the Independent Social Democratic Party. 
Now that party certainly had been moving to the left. Uh, we know that from its Congress held in October of 1919, in which it voted not to join the Second International. Now it didn't vote to join the Third International because there was too much opposition uh, from guys like Kowski and guys like Hans and so forth, but it was said that they would investigate that possibility. At that point, you see, the Russians, the common turn, really intervenes. And you, you begin to get a kind of maneuvering of the situation, maybe always fighting a sort of a plastic fight to keep an autonomy of this particular party sufficient to read the conditions of the moment. Now, for the Russians, the idea of a fusion uh, between the Communists and the USPT was magnificent. Uh, the USPT was a huge party of 800,000 at that time, which had 54 newspapers. Uh, the Communists could become, you see, a mass party overnight. But then there is a danger to that. You have all of these people who aren't really Bolsheviks. What do you do, even if they say they are willing to join the Third International? Now, for the Russians, it's a life and death battle. Because by the time you're in 1920, and you're at that Second World Congress in July and August, they really think that the revolution is coming. There are those troops before Warsaw. There is that great rail strike in France. There is the occupation of the factories in Italy. Germany can really pull the switch. And so it's very important. Well, what do you do? What you do is to impose the 21 conditions. I you say that those 21 conditions will assure uh, that these independent social democrats will then become good Bolsheviks. And so that is imposed as the condition uh, for the USPD of uh, joining the Third International and consequently being able to fuse with the communists. Well, the leftward drift within the independent socialists goes on and consequently when they get to their Congress in October of 1920, there is a furious debate, but they vote to join the Third International with those 21 conditions. Now, no, Zinoviev was there in person. Zinoviev was the president of the International. He came and spoke in German, which he spoke badly, for four and a half hours. And they said it was fascinating. And what he said was, we are in 1847, which means that the revolution will come. And consequently, uh, you must be prepared for that, uh, but you must be very good communists and really observe uh, these 21 conditions. After that Congress, there is a fusion Congress held in the city of Halle in Saxony in December of 1920. And those independent social democrats who can accept the Third International, which is about half because a schism did take place, uh, representing about 400,000 fused uh, with the German Communist Party. Uh, by the end of 1920, you have a united party of over a half million. With 33 daily newspapers, you suddenly have a mass party, the first in the country. But what do you do? And when do you do that? And that's the problem. Now you see, Lenin is very sick, but he's also sick and tired, and also sick and tired. And consequently, toward the end of 1920, Lenin is saying that he's not the same as he was in the summer of 1920, that there has been a relaxation of this revolutionary drama, that we're on the other side of the curve now, that perhaps it's a time for sieges and not for assault. No, no, not Zinoviev. Zinoviev was really hot air personified. And this is a man who really loved these four and a half hour discourses, but also was there as the president of the common turn and was surrounded by our executive committee. You now have to understand that the executive committee of the Communist International is full of the ones whom, whom uh, Paul Navy is ultimately going to call the Turkestani. He doesn't know what else to call them, indicating that they come from obscure places. But it's full of Bulgarians, it's full of Poles, it's full of Hungarians, all the people who have tried to make their Revolutions in 1919 and failed. They're now all in the executive committee, and so they're ultra leftists because they have to avenge their failure. Nobody more 
more so than Belakum. After all, he could humbly not in Hungary, and consequently, why not make a successful revolution with other people's risk? And consequently, that kind of group surrounds Adolfia, and it's his idea that Germany, after all, is right for revolution, and that in 1921, there really has to be a major offensive. Now, the problem is Levy and his leadership. Levy is a very brilliant and very sober guy, and consequently, he doesn't think at all that the situation is revolutionary or that the consciousness of the German working class is right in any way, shape, or form. And consequently, an assault begins upon him. It's an assault that comes from the common term of from Zinoviev, who says, for example, that he is over-conscientious about stopping butchers, so that he has a phobia about butchers. And then, because you have this big party now, a new left begins to develop inside the party. In other words, in the Berlin section, and know it well, because it really does play a part. In the Berlin section, you begin to get that whole party dominated by certain ultra-leftist elements, namely uh, Frieda Eisler, or whom we know as Ruth Fisher, and whom we knew before the House of American Activities Committee of years later, and testified against her brother, Gerhard Eisler. And consequently, Ruth Fisher had this particular type, a brilliant girl, uh, whose daughter of a philosophy professor in Austria, a member of the Austrian Communist Party, finally resident in Berlin, and of the right, in a sense, a follower of Davy when she first comes to Germany, but then falls in love with somebody called Maslow. And Maslow is her lifetime companion, and he is both a leftist. He is a former student of Einstein in physics, and he is comes of a rich Jewish family from Russia who settled in Germany, and he begins to deal with some of those very left-wing intellectuals like Lukács, who are writing in the newspaper called Communismus, and their whole line is that it is time for an offensive. It's time for an offensive, and Levy will not do it. So there is an orchestrated attack upon the leadership. Levy answers in a very interesting way. And really, it is a serious problem, because whether you make an offensive or not can really, in a sense, uh, determine the history or the destiny of your movement for a period of time. Then he says, yes, we must move from words to action, but we must move to those actions that are understood by people. And what he proposes are a series of united front actions with workers who are in communist, with socialist workers, with non-party workers, who are in factories, go into the unions, go into the factories, and pose questions that are basically reformist questions. Questions of wages, of questions of worker control, of questions of, of unemployment insurance. And in that way, we're not going to change the system, says Levy, but what we will do will be expose the leadership of the social democrats, will prove that they won't even fight uh, for their workers, and also we will show something about what the system is, how resistant it is to any kind of change, any kind of amelioration. And so what Levy does is to publish an open letter in the road to Fata on the 8th of January of 1921, addressed to Social Democrats, addressed to trade unions, addressed to the KAKD, addressed to everybody, in which he says, let's have a these united fronts. Now, parenthetically, that is exactly the common turn position in 1922. Levy at the right position at the wrong time. And consequently, this was the way of getting to the mass. Well, the left in the party, and it's an and so forth, were furious that this was again a sellout, this was again begging the question of the street action of the revolution. And so maybe he goes along at the end of January 1921 uh, to Italy to the Congress of Novorno, a very important Congress of the Italian Socialist Party as the German uh, Communist uh, uh, delegate. And it is a, a Congress of the Italian Socialist Party to determine uh, whether uh, the Italian Socialist Party will defer the 21 conditions and join the Common Party. And there is a big attack uh, by the Common Turn agents. They send down Matthias Rakossi. Now, Rakossi doesn't have a good reputation as the Communist voice of Hungary, does he? But here he is, doesn't have a good reputation as the Common Turn either. 
and he is now a Italy, a ruling Bulgaria, and a Pole to dominate Italian affairs at this moment. And so they say, this is coming to turn ages, that Sarati, the head of the Italian Socialist Party, has got to boot out his little right wing, he's got to observe these 21 conditions. But Paul Lane, who is there simply as a delegate from Germany, defends Sarati, and defends the right of the Italians to make their own decision. Rakosi and the commentary agents are furious. On their way back to Moscow, they stop in Berlin, and they say, you know, that this may be undermined the commentary, you should be disciplined, and when the Central Committee disciplined or censures Davy, he and Garis Edkin and three others resign from the Central Committee, and he goes into left-wing hands. And that is the background of the moral action. The March Action of 1921. Now, the March Action is fascinating because it starts with Ben Akun coming to Germany. And he comes on the 1st of March with this idea, and this is really what the tragedy is because lots of lives are at stake. Ben Akun comes down and he says Russia is in real trouble. That there are centers of peasant resistance, it's right at the time of Kronstadt, and consequently, she either has to make a huge step backward and go into that new economic policy, which means that communism will be delayed, or there will be a revolution in Germany. There must be a revolution in Germany. And so then Akhun goes and he looks and he says, I see centers of resistance in the country. He says, I see that the French have just occupied Dusseldorf because there have not been enough reparation payments. I see that in Bavaria, the Bavarian government refuses to disband the Orgesh, which is a right-wing paramilitary group, as the central government demands. Mainly, I see in Monsfeld, in central Saxony, I see in the mine areas a lot of communist miners and workers who are unemployed, who are very insurgent. It looks to me as though we have a revolutionary situation. Levy says no, but he's now in the Central Committee. And Balakun, talking to Levy and talking to Garazekin, says, well, you know, sometimes in order to get people roused up, you have to make a provocation. Well, fortunately, the government made a slight provocation. On the 16th of March of 1921, the president of Saxony, uh, who was a social democrat named Horsing, the president of Saxony, said that all of the workers in the Monsfeld area were to be disarmed. Many of them had kept their weapons from the time of the top push, but they were now to be disarmed by police and troops, so that on the 17th of March, the Central Committee of the German Communist Party proclaimed an armed insurrection, urged workers all over the country uh, to rise up in an insurrection. That went on for about five days in a wholly desultory way. Only in Monsfeld was there any action at all, and consequently, by the 22nd of March, it is a Central Committee guy, Eberlein, who goes to Hanover, which is the main city of that Saxon district, and says, look, you've got to stir something up down here, even if it is a question of a provocation. Uh, kidnap one of your own leaders and say the police did it, or bomb your building and say the police did it. Well, as a matter of fact, they didn't need that because they arrived on the scene by Hobbes. Now Hobbes, you know, you find it difficult to talk about because he is a brave guy. This is one of the great geniuses of urban guerrilla bands. This is a guy who, in Saxony, in 1919, had organized all kinds of unemployed workers into urban guerrilla bands that robbed banks and robbed factories and gave to the poor. It was known as a rotten bullet, and consequently they kept some for themselves, to be sure, but they never made a connection. In other words, those tactics really didn't convey to the mass at all. Hopes were not in half on the scene. Consequently, for about a week, there really is a kind of fury in the area around Moscow. It has a chain effect. In Hamburg, there's tyranny. 
later dies a book called That Room, So Many Songs and Poems Are Written. Eric's kind of mom that makes a, a, a kind of a rising of dock workers in Humber, but the government comes in and represses it. The point is that by the 1st of April, the march action was dead. Thousands had been arrested, hundreds had been killed, literally hundreds of thousands were involved in the fear of losing their jobs. Every communist could have lost his job in that particular moment. It was a catastrophe to have done that. And maybe had the guts to say so. And you know to Lenin on the 27th of March, and he said, it's crazy that Melachim has come down and he has done this. And you have to hand it to Lenin, because when he answers, he says, that a representative of the executive of the international should have proposed that in addition to it. So imbecilic and unreal, in order to help us, is something I can unfortunately believe. The particular representative lived by being cultural language. And yet, on the 6th of April, when the Central Committee of the German Communist Party met, they said that the failure of that March action was due to the Social Democrats. No criticism made of the commentary, no criticism made of themselves. And that very same day, the Executive Committee of the Commentary met in Moscow under the leadership of Zinovia and passed this resolution. The Communist International says to you, addressing the Germans, you have done very well. You have turned a page in the history of the German working class. Prepare the next assault. Well, of course, that got laid me absolutely afraid. And so he went outside the whole party framework and he published a famous brochure called Our Way Once Again Coachism. And in it, you find some of the most serious writing about the relationship between Commenter and Pentay. Listen, it is entirely sufficient for an anarchist club if the will of the leader commands and the courage of the believers in the face of death obey. It is, however, not sufficient for a mass party which does not only want to set masses in motion, but which is itself a mass. It is proper to expect of communists that they quickly detect and vigorously utilize every situation conducive to struggle, and that they always point to the final aim beyond the aim of the immediate struggle. But no communist is obliged or qualified or for that matter uh, to detect a fighting situation where there is none, and where nothing but the will of the centrale decides on the existence of such a situation in a secret meeting. He goes on then to say about the relationship of these commentary agents. They never work with us, but always behind the back, and frequently against the Central Committee of a given country. They are trusted in Moscow, others are not. This is a system which is bound to undermine all confidence in reciprocal work on both sides, on the side of the executive, as well as on the side of the member party. He goes on then to describe a common current agent network. To begin with, Russia is not in a position to use its best people for this purpose. As a consequence, comrades arrive in Europe, each one of whom is filled with good intentions and ideas of his own, zealous for the chance to demonstrate how he brings a thing off successful. Thus, West Europe and Germany become the testing ground for all sorts of miniature statesmen who give the impression that they want to develop their skills here. I have nothing against the Turkestanians and wish them no ill, but I often feel that these people with their clever tricks would reap less damage there in Turkestan. As you see, David was not exonerated. By the time the Third Congress of the Common Turret met in Moscow, in the summer of 1921, Lenin and Trotsky and all of the responsible Bolsheviks were perfectly willing to say that the March action was a terrific mistake. Lenin's analysis was almost letter by letter the analysis of Paul Lenin, that it had not been the time to do this adventuresome thing. And yet, that common turn agreed that Lenin had broken discipline, he had published a brochure outside of organization of the party, and he was expelled from the communist movement, and it was warned to his followers, Narazekin and others, that they were not to organize a faction, because nothing was more dangerous in a communist party than a faction. 
Now, you know that Lenin was a factionalist, a magnificent factionalist, and he believed in the full area of all of these kinds of debates and disputes. But right there, in Russia, of 1921, at the 10th Party Congress of the Soviet Union, they had passed an anti-factional rule because Russia was in such deep trouble at that time. But then they imposed it upon these other so, when he gets to 1923, and it is possible, then the common friend says no. It's been in Germany, and as you know, those German communists who died in concentration camps really did deserve better than that. That party had to remain dead.